Um, I'm a, a tech professional since uh, 99. I actually started off in uh, core engineering. It's about the same amount of time, or actually it's exactly the same amount of time that I've lived in Germany. I've lived in Germany since 99 when I came here and realized that having a master's in history wasn't gonna pay me much money uh, in Germany. So I went back to, to my first love, which is computers. I'd studied computers in the 80s and, and I've been doing that ever since. Started off in core engineering, uh, working for a couple small German companies in C++ and Java. Went to the US, moved into professional services, and, and for the last six months I've been with Puppet Software as a senior sales engineer working in DACH. So I'm uh, responsible for um, Germany, Austria, and, and Switzerland. And you see my contact details. If anybody wants to reach out to me, please do so. A bit about Puppet. Puppet has been around since longer than DevOps. Uh, it was founded in 2005 by Luke Cannes, who was a sysadmin who basically wanted to do stuff, needed the tools for it, and they didn't exist. So he said, okay, I'll just write them. So, so in doing so, he, he wrote uh, the core Puppet product, and in doing so, he created the concept of infrastructure as code. Uh, we've had an enterprise offering for the last five or six years which is basically just on top of the, the open source offering that so many people use. As you see, 40,000 different organizations uh, use Puppet worldwide. That's at a minimum, because we really don't know who downloads the open source and who uses it. Uh, we have over 1,000, well over 1,000 enterprise customers, including 75 of the Fortune 100 companies. Um, and we have a very active open source community, one of the most active open source communities out there. Uh, well over 5,000 modules have been written by the community. They're freely available on Puppet Forge to download 7.5 million lines of code. Um, so I have to admit, I, I'm just going I'm, I'm just going to take a digression here uh, that I've, I've been, you know, I applied for this uh, speaking position a few months ago, and, and I just have to admit I've, I've been a little bit scared shitless uh, coming up to it because <coughs> dirty little secret, Puppet doesn't actually pay me for open source. So it, it's possible in, the, in this talk that I might be talking about things now and then uh, that aren't necessarily open source. Anyway, so please don't throw fruit. That's all I'm asking. Um, so what does Puppet do? In a nutshell, Puppet automates, just a second, I could read this, how you build and deploy applications and provision, configure, and manage the infrastructure they run on. Just, just as a note, uh, this is the marketing portion of my, my talk. Uh, I will get onto what I, I'm a techie, so I'm gonna get onto some demos. Specifically, I'm going to uh, demo some newer features in Puppet Enterprise and Puppet Open Source, uh, namely um, ad hoc tasks. And also, I'd like to demo uh, one of our newest features, which is a CI CD tool. Anyway, that's it. Uh, so in other words, but, but now we've now we got to get through the, uh, the marketing part of the, the talk. So, so please bear with me about 10 minutes, and, and we'll be done and through it. So in other words, it helps you build software better and faster. And why, so, why is that important? Because our customers tell, it's, tell us it's important. Another thing that Puppet does, and has done so for the last six years, is with the cooperation of other organizations, publish the DevOps report. This is, uh, we go out and ask internet or uh, technical professionals, 27,000 different people have responded to the 2017 report, and they tell us that they are following the born in the cloud companies, right? So the Googles, the Spotify, the Netflix. These companies have DevOps in their genes they can deploy code hundreds of times a day, right? So why should we care about that? I mean, ultimately, the customers, the reason we need to care is because the customers of Google and Spotify and Netflix are our customers as well, right? So when they expect fast turnaround on a bug from Google, they don't understand why the software we're producing doesn't have exactly that fast turnaround. So whether we like it or not, we have to compete in the market that's been created by these large corporations. 
In doing so, Puppet has identified three basic issues or hurdles in automating these processes and moving towards the real reality or the realization of DevOps. The first is, sorry, uh, and this, this is the journey to, to uh, pervasive automation because we can't just um, immediately do what these Googles and what these Spotify's are doing, right? I mean, we have to create, a, create the DevOps reality day for day over time. And the first hurdle that we find is that we don't really know what we have, right? Um, maybe if you're a boutique shop, maybe if you just have a few AIXs under your desks, you know the infrastructure in your company. But the reality is most companies have a hybrid infrastructure. They have on-premises solutions, they have Amazon solutions and all that. So what we've developed is Puppet Discovery. This is one of the newest, it's a very new product from Puppet, and it allows you to look into your infrastructures, hybrid infrastructures, and see not just what you have, but what it's running. And not just what is running on it, but you can actually perform actions on it from this one dashboard. Okay, Puppet Discovery, that's the, the first leg of the triangle, knowing what you have. The second is scaling across your infrastructure broadly and deeply. So not just across the entire infrastructure, but across all the different systems you have in all the, the different uh, centers that you have. That is why Luke Canny's created Puppet. Um, it's, it works vendor neutral. Doesn't care if it's an AIX box, doesn't care if it's a, a CentOS or SUSE. You just define your state and you let it run, do its thing. It is primarily model driven. This has been the, the paradigm that it was based on and, and is the primary uh, source of benefit from Puppet Enterprise, meaning you define your desired state on your host. Puppet sees it, it gets to that state, and it maintains that state. And it's also ad hoc. So if you need uh, you know, one off or, or something like that, then uh, you're, it's more than possible to uh, run that from Puppet Enterprise or from uh, the open source uh, command line interface. So, so now we've created our infrastructure. We have that, right? But as far as I know, people aren't creating and maintaining infrastructures because it's fun because they have real benefit from just running infrastructures, you have to put something on it, right? Whether it's for internal consumption or for external customers. And for that, <coughs> excuse me. And for that, we look at Dev DevOps to help us marry the development teams and the operations teams. And we still see problems in that relationship. There's some automation. You know, maybe you have a web sphere uh, that's being installed uh, automatically, but the software behind it perhaps is still a manual process, right? So you do see these silos of automation, but you don't see it across the breadth and depth of your, your organizations. So what we've created is puppet pipelines. And, and actually, when I say created, what I mean is uh, this was created by uh, Raul Singh, who was AWS's number four employee who saw that there were gaps in the CI CD pipeline, right? So AWS, they did that great. They married the software development with the operations, and he wanted to bring that to other companies. He created a company named Distelli and created the pipelines tool, which we brought into the fold uh, about eight months ago now. Raul is now the, the VP of engineering at, at uh, Puppet. Okay, so that's the three products that uh, Pipebit offers right now. Uh, we have, on the one hand, discovering the infrastructure, seeing what uh, is out there. Uh, on the other hand, we have the ability to scale across these infrastructures. And uh, finally, we have the CI CD tool, true continuous integration and continuous delivery tool for bringing the software that your company needs to produce to the operations. Okay, so what I wanted to do now was, this is a little bit of a digression because this isn't the core products, but uh, I wanted to talk about Puppet Tasks because this is something that isn't so known yet among Puppet practitioners. 
Um, as I've said, it is a primarily model-based system, and this is an ad hoc possibility to run different tasks. I should, uh, let me just uh, ask if there's any questions at this point from, from anything I've said, and take a little sip from my refreshing beverage. So, model-based. You define your state. You don't have to tell your system how to get to the state. You define it, it gets there, it maintains that state. You could do it with your house, right? I want my house clean. You don't say, well, if it's dusty, then get out the duster and dust it. You don't say, get out the vacuum cleaner. You just say, no, just clean it. And it's clean, right? So that's defining the state that you want it at. Puppet ensures that it gets to that state. It's a very powerful concept. Here, for instance, you see the code that is required for Puppet to install and maintain the screen application. Of course, the way you install it is going to be different on Debian or CentOS or what have you. But with Puppet, you define it once. You say, just make sure it's installed. And it knows how to do it on every other system. It's not great for everything. Defining and maintaining state doesn't work, for instance, for quick troubleshooting. One-off changes, upgrades to a system or something like that. If you're not maintaining the system, then it's not going to work to model a state. Complex deployment workflows. So for that reason, where are we at? We created Puppet Tasks. Puppet Tasks has actually been around for a little while now. Um, I believe it was introduced uh, late last year, so Puppet Enterprise 2017.3 had it in. Um, Puppet Open Source 5.3, I'm not sure which. So it, it has been around for, for a while now. And there are two flavors. You have Puppet Bolt, and this is the pure open source. This has nothing to do with Puppet. You don't have to have anything else running. It's free to download today. Uh, and then you have Puppet Enterprise Task Manager. And this works with, uh, not with SSH or WinRM, as does Puppet Bolt, but this works with the Puppet um, control protocol. So it's actually not running over SSH to make changes, uh, ad hoc changes. What is a task? What tasks does it run? This is a very simple task. Simply a bash script, right? So Puppet takes this script, Packages it up, sends it to the server, agentless, and runs it. What this means is you're not throwing anything away. If you have scripts that need to be run, if you have already developed a bunch of scripts, you can wrap them in a Puppet module and immediately use them across your operating systems. They can be in PowerShell for Windows, or Bash, or Python, or even Ansible. Only caveat is, the engine needs to be on the machine for the script that you're running. So if you're running Python, well, Python has to be installed on the target machine. It's very scalable. So Puppet Bolt works good for up to 500 servers or so. Um, with Puppet Enterprise Task Manager, it scales just like Puppet Enterprise does. You can run a task against 100,000 nodes simultaneously, if you wish. And also, it's been brought into the Puppet language, so you can chain tasks together, you can have them interoperate with other uh, parts of the language, put logic into them and all the rest. Any questions up to that point? Okay, and I just wanted to show uh, what that looks like in real life, what it means to, to run a task both uh, in Puppet Enterprise and uh, from Puppet Bolt. This is the Puppet Enterprise uh, Puppet console. Let me just log into it. And what you see is the, the standard dashboard for Puppet Enterprise showing the infrastructure that I am currently managing. You see it's a very small infrastructure. This is all local, uh, just four nodes. And what you're seeing here are the results of the state based, the state-modeled 
uh, maintenance. So any changes to that state that needed to be brought into focus, anything that changed and needed to be changed back, you would see here. Various nodes that are running in the system. I just have four little nodes running. And down here you see, for, for anybody who is currently using Puppet Enterprise, these two tasks here are new. And these are the Puppet Enterprise Task Management additions. So running a task then becomes quite simple from a central point. You have the task that you want to run here. You see a few that I've installed on my system. Uh, in Puppet Forge, there are now, I think, 170 modules that have Puppet tasks that can be installed uh, on your system. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this task. This is I installed, especially this is an exec task. It's just as powerful and as dangerous as it sounds. Um, and I'm going to do something, I mean, you know, uh, probably nothing like that, but uh, something more harmless like that. I can then determine where it's going to run. And in this case, I'll just run it across everything. Hello? Right, so I've determined which nodes I want this to run on. I've determined the command that I want to run. And I just run it. So from a central dashboard, or from command line, or from the API, you can run arbitrary tasks across an entire infrastructure. Here I have four nodes. I could have run that off uh, against 40,000. Maybe a little more specific uh, use case. Let's say we just learned that there's this thing called Heartbleed, uh, and we need to do something about it. And so I can go in here and say, <coughs> Heartbleed is a, is a weakness in OpenSSL. Where do I have that weakness? And I see, for instance, uh, here on one node, I'm using a, a version of OpenSSL that is problematic, that does uh, express that vulnerability. Go here, all I want to do is run a package command. It was, pr it was selected for me because, uh, because I'm going through the package selection. Yeah. <laughs> so is, was there a log of, of, of who was screwing with the system? So that's a thank you, because that's, that's another great benefit of Puppet Enterprise is the uh, responsibility, chain of responsibility. Yes, there are logs. And it shows exactly who did what when. It also shows, for instance, uh, if a system was changed by somebody through the command line, not necessarily who did it, but that it had to be changed back. So yeah, there is there's that sort of logging. OK, so I'm going to upgrade uh, this package. It's OpenSSL already selected, because that was the path that I went through to get here. And the node that I want to do it on was also selected, because, because I selected specifically that version of the package to run. Uh, you let it go. Again, this is very good at scaling, because it's not the master that's doing this upgrading. It's the nodes. So it can just send off this. Command say, all 100,000 nodes, please upgrade OpenSSL, and it does it. And then you see the old version. It went from 101, 101E to 102K, which is no longer vulnerable to OpenSSL. And here we can see the different reports. And you can see everything that happened. Uh, I have here an error. I could see what was uh, going on there. And in this system, I don't have any changes. You would see a little blue circle or a yellow circle, depending on whether it was an expected change or an unexpected change. OK, so that's Puppet Enterprise Task Manager. Uh, because we're at an open source uh, conference, I thought it would be not a bad thing to, to show some open source as well. Uh, so let's uh, go into Puppet Bolt a little bit. What you see here is, is a very simple, naive uh, application. Uh, you can also notice, as I refresh the page, down in the lower left, 
that we're getting a different server. So what this is is a two-node web application with a load balancer in front of it. <coughs> Excuse me. What I would like to do is upgrade this application uh, with zero downtime, right? So I, I want to pull one of the nodes from the load balancer, upgrade that node, bring it back up without users noticing that anything had happened. I can do that with Puppet Bolt. So what I'm going to do here is run a series of tasks, exactly those three tasks. First, it's going to take one of the nodes in the load balancer. It's going to pull it out, wait a few seconds while the, the sessions drain. It's going to upgrade it through Docker, and then it's going to bring it back into the load balancer. So command line tool. Again, this is open source, can be downloaded uh, freely. I'm going to run a plan, right? Absolutely. Is that okay? Very good. Um, and in fact, the plan that I'm going to run is called upgrade web server. I have to tell it where to find this uh, stuff. And I have to tell it, sorry, yeah, where it needs to run. And because I don't want to bother you with this long, ugly uh, URL, I'll just do the shortcut. And I also want to tell it which Docker tag to upgrade to. And again, because I forgot, I'll just do this. And actually, we can just uh, see that it uh, resolves to, to this stuff right there. OK, so I've let it loose. And we'll see here, if you look at the lower left, at some point, one of the nodes will drop out. And there you see, one of the nodes is gone. Again, you know, this, this is a very real use case. I don't know if people here are, are uh, in web development, but that is a very typical use case. You, you pull your nodes out one by one, and you upgrade the instance, and then you only bring it back online once it's uh, upgraded. So, and then we see it's now come back online seamlessly, no downtime, and so on. Okay, and that concludes my talk about tasks, both Puppet Enterprise Task Manager and Bolt. I'd like to move on to a different way to deploy code, which is a CI/CD tool, uh, and just ask at this point <clears throat> if there's any questions from anybody. Among the other things I did was uh, I was a graduate instructor, so <clears throat> I learned how to be silent for a long amount of time because graduate students don't ever say anything if they don't have to. Okay. Again, I'm just going to use <clears throat> the exact same application that I used before and just uh, for a little more uh, edification. It's a two-phase application. So you've got the back end, you've got the front end. Uh, it has REST services that are feeding into it. You see the REST services here. Uh, and it produces, this is, it, it's basically just a, a grust, a, you know, it's just a framework that doesn't actually do anything. And instead of seeing, I've, I've changed it a little bit, <clears throat> now you see the environment. So right now what, what you're seeing is the development environment. And if we look over here, this is the production environment, and, and you can see some changes because your production is probably not going to be the same as your dev, right? So you see that they're two different systems. There are lots of CI tools out there. Team City, Jenkins, quite a few, right? Um, the difficulty in the CI CD pipeline is, is getting the artifacts that you're creating and installing them in the environments where you want them to be. This is not an easy task to do. You can do it in Jenkins. 
It's not easy. And then don't breathe and, and, and hopefully it won't, uh, it won't uh, stop working. So, as I said, this was uh, kind of the hobby horse, or not the hobby horse, or, but the uh, real need identified by Raul Singh at, at AWS, this need to bring a simple and resilient CI-CD tool to the market. Okay, so what you see here is, is the Puppet Pipeline's uh, application. Uh, with applications installed, you see here I have four applications installed, including the application you've seen, the back end, and you also see the front end. So that's all part of uh, this. Uh, so what you're seeing is the connection to the repositories where the developer ostensibly would be publishing the code and, and uh, making the changes. Uh, and what you also see here, I'm just gonna jump to servers, and this is where you identify where you want these artifacts that are being created in the, in the CI tool to be installed, okay? It's possible to have uh, many different servers. You can actually create cloud-based servers from Google or from AWS from this uh, dashboard, so very easy to expand your infrastructure. Another way to look at it is through dashboards. That's where I'm gonna hop to now. And what you see, let's see, I don't know if I wanna make that smaller, I'll make it a little bit smaller, <coughs> is this application called the Daybook application that, that I showed you on the uh, website. And it gives a very good overview of the health and the status of the application. Above you see the API, the REST-based API application, and below you see the, the web front end. You could have multiple applications here. Um, for instance, different branches. You could have logically uh, related uh, applications, for instance, if one application was dependent on another application. And what you're seeing here, so on, on the left, you can call that the CI part of the application. This is where the build happens, and these are the different environments, the different servers, where they are installed, these artifacts that are being built. Here I have my development environment, you've got the QA, and then finally the production environment. And it shows you the logical flow, the way that I've envisioned that this application should go. And, and just to, to demonstrate, let me uh, push a change here. So I've already got one loaded up. Uh, actually, so you see here, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the message of the day, kind of boring, so let's do something about that. Um, and ping. And if I go back here, then, <clears throat> you know, webhooks have been installed. If you include another, another application, it goes out to, to Git or to Bitbucket or what have you. And it uh, registers a web app, a webhook. And so we'll start to see this process proceed through this pipeline, right? First with the build on the left, uh, moving on to the, the various deployments to the right. So it should kick off here quickly, assuming my Wi-Fi is working, okay. Uh, this is the SaaS version of the software. So it does have to wait for a build server, right? So you've got various uh, Docker images that run the different build servers. Uh, it can also be run on premises, behind uh, a firewall or, or behind the DMZ. Okay, so that's gonna start building. What I've done is I've created a fairly naive workflow. You've got the, the build on the left. That's going to build the artifact. It's gonna push it up to Docker Hub. And then it's gonna say, okay, if that successfully builds, go ahead and deploy it automatically into my development environment. Very typical use case, right? The developers have developed something on their, their laptop and now you wanna make sure that it works on a public system so it's gonna immediately publish it to that system. What I've also said is once it successfully installs into the development environment, go ahead and install it in the QA environment. Not as typical. Generally, you wouldn't be installing every 
uh, developer release in immediately into QA. <clears throat> but what you do see over here is that the version for production is very different than the version for QA. Here we have 34, and the newest one is, is currently version 35. That is not untypical, right? So you're not going to want to just automatically be publishing uh, all your releases straight into production. <coughs> and once this gets through, then I'll go ahead and, and show you uh, how actually you can promote a particular artifact into production. There are different ways to do it. <coughs> you can do it just from here through a button click. Or you can also say that there have to be a certain set of users who approve a certain release. Right? So you can define within pipelines who gets to do what? Who gets to create a new workflow? Who gets to just look at things but not touch? Or who is responsible for determining what gets promoted to where? OK, so it's uh, successfully deployed it into the development environment. We can actually go out and look at that. If we refresh this here, then we have the new MOTD, which is a little bit more useful than, than what we had. <clears throat> but then, again, so now it's completed. It's done. We still have version 25. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to promote this to the latest version. So actually, if we go back to the production and refresh, we see that it is still the old version. So I'm going to deploy this to this production environment. I'm going to deploy the one that was just created and just deployed, and the QA errors are, we're all very happy with. This isn't a new artifact. I'm not creating a new artifact. I'm not pulling anything else. This is the exact same artifact that was published in my dev environments and in my QA environments. And what you see, it also has an automatic staggering. So it does have that concept of uh, no downtime deployment. And you fire it off, and then you can see the, you can watch the progress as it deploys into production. Any questions up to, to that point? As I said, this is the SaaS version of it. Uh, it is also free to download as an on-premises version. Uh, and the SaaS is free to use uh, up to a certain point. I think you can have up to five nodes or something like that, so deployment nodes uh, free to use. OK, and, and what I'm going to show is one last thing. As I said, it should also be simple. So it shouldn't just be transparent. So anybody can look and see what the, the status is. Uh, it shouldn't just be resilient, but it should also be simple. And so what we have is, is kind of a, a, a self-service portal for the different members on your team. So I want to install a new application. Just go to New App. And then you see the different integrations that we have for this. So Bitbucket, GitHub, if you're using something else, SVN or what have you, then you could go no repository, and there are other methods for triggering a build. In this case, I'm going to use Bitbucket. <clears throat> goes out to the web using Bitbucket's APIs and finds out. So I've already uh, authorized pipelines to use my Bitbucket account so it knows my, uh, my different projects. I'm going to grab this one. Again, it goes and says, OK, which branch do you want to use? Just use the master. And then it asks you how you want to build it. It doesn't have to be a Docker build. It could be a Java build or Python or what have you. And here it tells you, OK, what are your build steps? And it gives you a few examples of how uh, a Python build script might look like. But as I said, uh, I'm going to be doing this in Docker. I will determine the uh, Docker Hub uh, repository. Let's see, what is that called? Flask demo, I believe. The container repository where I want that to be pushed to. And then it immediately gives me potential build code for, uh, for creating this artifact. I'm going to go ahead and do this. So what Pipelines also offers you is the ability to 
define in your repository uh, the build steps that you want and also the steps that you need for deploying or uh, publishing your artifact. Here I don't need a, a particular build uh, server. I don't need a Python build server. It's just Docker. I'm just going to go ahead and let it uh, use the default. And we let it run. And there you see it's already getting ready to build. <coughs> and I go to the application landing page, and what you see is, is more or less the feed of what's happening with your application. So right now you see uh, it's gotten a change, or rather it's, it's the initial deploy. So it's pulling the, art of the, uh, the code and it's going to uh, build it as soon as it gets a chance. And what this page also allows you to do is to create this workflow. What do you want it to do when it's created the artifact and, and uh, published it? So here you can define environments. As I showed in the web application, uh, I have my dev environment, my staging, and all that. So let's go ahead and, and uh, create a couple here. Get my dev. Oops. Do all the, the standard, if you will, environments. And you can be as creative as, as you want here. I mean, this, you know, you can have multiple uh, QA environments, for instance. <clears throat> you could create an artifact and have it installed to 10 different environments at the same time. Not a problem. So I have my environments. Uh, they don't have any servers registered with them yet, but I can go out and I've got my, my various servers and I can just assign one or more servers to a particular environment. And, and if you define that a environment should be installed to, then all the servers will have that code installed at the same time. Okay. For my prod, I actually have two, so I'm going to have a high availability system there. You see here the two servers have been installed. QA, I've got a server, and last but not least, my staging. Somewhere there. Okay. Let's go back to the overview. It is completed. You see that the image has been pushed up to Docker Hub. And then, oops, is that what I wanted? Yes, I did. Now what I'm going to do is say, OK, when you've built, put it somewhere. And I've created my first pipeline. And I'm going to say, you know what, auto deploy it. If that build succeeds, just go ahead and shove it right into Dev. Let's do it again. Next uh, step. Again, this is going to be my QA environment. And I'm going to do it as I did with the, the Daybook application. I'm going to say install it into two environments at the same time. In this case, what I want to say is if they all succeed. If, if the environment successfully installed, then go ahead and push it into the QA environment. And then finally, let's get to the production. And I'm not going to auto-deploy. I could do the same thing there, but you know it's production, so let's not have it auto-deploy. OK, so let's go up to here, and we see this is the production environment again. So we can see down here it's production. This is the one that I uh, deployed to manually, and we see, OK, it's a new version and all that. Guess what? Bugs. Something happened, we didn't catch it in QA, now we have to roll back. The hated rollback. Not so hated in pipelines. So if we go here, where am I going? Right there. I can just say, uh, what do I want to do? I think I want to do that. Let me just check. Yes, I do. Uh, I'm going to deploy, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and find a, a safe version. Or an, oh yeah, crap, sorry. Getting ahead of myself. Right, so this is the version that was installed before. Again, I'm not, I'm not rolling back my Git. I'm not doing a new release. 
I'm going back to a known stable artifact, and I want to install it there. So this is as painless a rollback as you're ever going to see. Good. I mean, I'm using Docker, so, and I don't have a database, and, and there's lots of caveats. Uh, but this sort of functionality, I mean, I would have loved in my previous life as a, as a core developer. Uh, I don't know if people work in, in software, but basically rolling back was always, always, always far more painful than uh, simply living with reality and moving forward. Okay, so I've, I've said, uh, you know, we have to go back to an earlier version, uh, and it's immediately doing uh, the uh, deployment. And we'll just give it a few seconds and it'll complete, and then we can see that the, uh, the original version of the application was, in fact, reinstalled. So let's see, it should come up quite quickly. If we go back, yeah, then we have the original version of dev uh, reinstalled. Uh, last thing I'll show you, um, this is uh, the manifest that uh, defines the different build steps you see here. This is a Docker application. Uh, this is actually a pretty poor example because it doesn't show much. But if I go here, then you see a few more steps. You see the build step. What Build Pipelines also does is it monitors your application if you desire it. So anything in this execution step that's started in the environment, if that ever stops running, Pipeline just starts it again. It doesn't have to be, but that's, that's uh, another feature of Pipelines. Um, and with that, I see I have two more minutes left to, to uh, my actual presentation, and then we'd have time for questions, but let's just uh, go ahead and leap over those two, two minutes and, and go to questions immediately. So is there anything uh, I could answer for you? Or is there anything you'd like to see that I haven't shown? Yeah? Sure, sure. The, mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, so that's a wonderful question. And the question is, so effectively, what's to prevent somebody from running a malicious command or a stupid command across 100,000 nodes, right? So what are the authentication or authorization restrictions on Puppet tasks? So with Puppet Bolt, that in this, in what I showed you was uh, using asynchronous uh, key authentication, right? So you can use uh, password authentication, but in, ba but in general that authorization and authentication is clear, I have to have the rights to that machine. With Puppet Enterprise Task Manager, it works with uh, access control. So it's an enterprise tool. It has uh, role-based uh, access controls. And you can say, these people have access to tasks. Or you can say, these people have access to this particular task. Or you can say, these people have access to this particular task on these servers. So that's very possible to, through the dashboard, define exactly who and what gets to do what. You know, I gave you the example of the exec command. It's, I'm always a little bit iffy if I should be showing that because I know there's a lot of sysadmins will be like, holy God. Um, <clears throat> that isn't by default. There, you have to install that. And then you can very clearly and carefully define who gets to use that power. Does that answer your question? Anything else I can answer for you? Or dig uh, deeper into? OK, then, thank you. And uh, have a good rest of your time.